The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar from the Women in Technology Virtual Chapter at PASS. My name is Kathy Kellenberger, and I'm the co-leader of the Women in Technology Virtual Group. Our group is meant to help encourage women in their careers, and our special role is giving women a place where they can present and possibly write uh, occasionally uh, and help to help them kind of take their careers to the next level. You can find all of our latest webinars on the YouTube channel, the Past TV YouTube channel. That's They've been there for about the past year. Previously, we had our own channel. Or you can go to our homepage at wit.pass.org to find links to all the previous recordings. Make sure you join our virtual group and you'll receive our monthly newsletter to find out more about what's going on in our chapter and to promote women who are speaking at, for our group and other events. You can also follow us on Twitter. And if you have any questions or if you'd like to get started speaking, email us at wit at pass.org. Here are just um, the webinars for all the virtual groups that are coming up. This list was compiled about a week ago, so hopefully we're not, I'm not missing too many that have just been assigned. Uh, some of them are our group, some of them are some of the other groups, and we really encourage you to join these webinars to help support women in our community. And I really have seen much more participation from women in these groups over the past couple of years. So I think, I think part of that is the work we're doing. Part of that is that women are just really stepping up and getting their voices heard because they've got a lot to talk about, especially in tech. There's a couple of other events coming up. Later this week, there's the Data Platform Summit. Uh, there's quite a few women speaking at that. I sent a list in the newsletter or not the newsletter, my uh, special email I sent over the weekend. And there's also another conference coming up next year called New Stars of Data. The calls for speakers is open right now, and they're also looking for mentors and moderators. This particular one is meant for people who have only spoken like at their local user group. And this is a chance for them to speak to a broader audience. Today's webinar is sponsored specifically by Redgate, and I have Eleanor Hughes from Redgate, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about what Redgate's doing in the community. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Um, as I'm sure Kathy said, I'm Eleanor, and I'm part of the communities and events team here at Redgate. We're really happy to be able to sponsor the Women in Tech class chapter, and um, yeah, we're looking forward to carrying that partnership on throughout 2021. Um, I just want to say a few words about something else we've got coming up that might be of interest to you. So our Friends of Redgate program will shortly be opening for 2021 applications. And if you or anyone in your network would be interested in applying for the program, then we'd love to hear from you. The program's made up of around 80 Microsoft data platform experts, um, lots of whom I'm sure you may know already. And we work with our friends to support the community by providing opportunities to collaborate on content such as articles, webinars like this one, and speaking sessions. We also connect them with our development teams so they can get the inside track on our products and share their insights and ideas to help shape the future of Redgate solutions. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in hearing more about, just drop me an email uh, to friends at red-gate.com. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy the main event with Elena. Today's session is building accessible software. What does that mean and why does it matter? And it will be presented by a Redgate employee, uh, Elena Lockyer, who is a product design designer at Redgate Software. And she's working on SQL Monitor, one of our products. And she loves sketching. She's very passionate about accessibility. And she's got a lot to tell us about today. And I'm going to make sure that. Oh, Elena, you are the presenter. I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic, and I'll be back on for questions at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Right, so now I've got to figure out how to share my screen and 
So actually, Kathy, it would be worth, can you just um, unmute yourself and just confirm you can see the correct slide before I progress? Yes. Looks good. Okay. Right, perfect. So right, with that, I shall continue and move some controls out of the way. Right, so um, yeah, I'm here to, to um, here today to talk about building accessible software. So yeah, hello. If you if you well, I was gonna say if you don't know me, I'm, I don't know if you will. But I'm a I'm a product designer with the SQL Monitor Design Group at Redgate, and thank you for coming along today. Um, I've been at Redgate. A little over a year working on SQL Monitor and I joined from university so yeah just over a year in October um, so what, what am I going to cover today um, so what does digital accessibility mean and how we can understand it what who can digital accessibility help why is it important to be accessible what can we do to improve our accessibility and build better software? Because that's what the title of the talk's about. And what we're doing at Reggae in this area. And I think it's probably just before we progress, it's important to bear in mind that a lot of this is perhaps in relation to web app websites or web applications, because that's the area I work in um, and what I'm learning about the most. But a lot of it's going to be applicable to you know most things. And I'm still learning a lot in this area at Redgate as part of my learning and development. And I, I want to share with you my learning today. And if there's something you think I've missed out, then I definitely welcome your feedback to improve this talk. So, um, yeah, I'll jump straight in. I'm going to cover these three things. So firstly, there's these three different areas that all kind of relate. And I think this will really help add some context around accessibility and what digital accessibility means and then how we can measure digital accessibility or understand if something is accessible. So firstly I want to take a step back like I said from accessibility and provide some context. Um, we can look at it through the lens of these three different areas I suppose because they all quite kind of relate to each other and, and sit hand in hand. So we'll start with inclusion and I've made, a, I've made a diagram and I'm not saying this is how you should or have to think of this. It's just a way of thinking about these areas that really help me. Um, and when we speak of inclusion, we're really, this is really about ensuring the involvement of everyone as much as possible in whatever is being done or whatever you do. So designing with inclusion in mind means that you're, you're designing in a diversity of ways um, with and for everyone so that everyone can participate in an experience with a real sense of belonging. And then we have um, this area of usability. And if we just go back to actually inclusion for a second, I think of it as a bit, as a bit of a wider term, hence why I've kind of drawn it like this, um, because it covers a lot of things. And one of those I wanted to pull out was, was usability. And we can think of usability as um, at the effectiveness, efficiency and satisfaction that users experience when attempting to achieve a specific goal. So you'll hear this term probably a lot with it, you know, within relation to an interface. But I think think of usability as something beyond that. Physical objects can um, can definitely have good usability, bad usability too. And actually, we just um, we just had I think it's World Usability Day the other week, and so we put on some a series of talks. Actually, um, the designers did at Redgate, so we all should be well, well enough educated. We held a, a usability competition as well, which was good fun. So that's usability um, and accessibility, which is what I'm going to talk with you say about. Is it's an area that really closely ties in with usability, but it's slightly different and. The reason they sort of link is because if you improve your um, accessibility, then you're likely to be improving the usability of your, your products too. So that's how I sort of think of things. So now we've got some context, we can move on to what digital accessibility means itself. So um, digital accessibility is the process and process is just a really important word. So digital accessibility is the process of making digital products that everyone can use equally. And digital products can mean obviously a lot of things. So websites, mobile apps, digital tools and other technologies. And when we refer to everyone, everyone means everyone, regardless of their ability. And picking up on this word or saying about use as well, 
Accessibility really can only be measured in relation to usage or how well someone is able to do something. It's not, it doesn't work like static, yes, this is accessible, no, this isn't accessible. It's very situational. Someone might find something accessible or not, depending on their needs. So when we're thinking about the word use as well, we can expand further when we say use equally because there's there's these five areas that anyone should be able to do with a digital product. So everyone should be able to perceive, understand, navigate, interact with and contribute to something. And I think the problem comes with accessibility is, um, is when we solve problems and make things using our own biases. So, so what do I mean by that? So, well, I think, and I'm so guilty of this myself, like we're likely to think, you know, when we've made something, oh, well, I understand that. I, I can obviously use it. I've tested it. I can interact with it. But what maybe we don't even realise we're doing that is what I'm trying to say, but it's really easy to do. But the, the problem is assuming that everyone's senses and abilities are simply like ours all of the time and, and that they're fully enabled. Um, creates the potential to ignore a large or exclude potentially exclude a large chunk of people because accessibility just becomes something that's overlooked during that process. So I thought this was a really nice way of um, of understanding what accessibility can mean as well and why it's important. So this is just a quote from Apple. So this is um, technology is most powerful when it empowers everyone. And I thought that was <laughs> quite a powerful statement in itself. So I just wanted to add that in. So on to who can digital accessibility help? So in this area, we're going to cover who accessibility helps, impairment and disability, impairments and disabilities, and also touch on assistive technologies. So I'll jump straight into this part. So <laughs> I love the illustrations, by the way. I hope they're not too distracting. Um, but We've spoken a lot about what digital accessibility means and what people should be able to do. Um, so I wanted to cover more about who it helps. And when we think about who accessibility might benefit, perhaps the most, the most obvious thought or something that comes to mind is that digital accessibility helps those with a wide range of impairments and disabilities. Um, this is this is true. This is who accessibility helps. But I, I wanted to share with you today that the benefits um, of accessibility and who accessibility helps aren't just experienced by some people. When we ask ourselves who can be helped by accessibility, um, the truth is that digital accessibility can help everyone. And a lot, a lot of the improvements we make to help people with impairments use our products will also benefit everyone else too. And this, I think this will hopefully become clearer as time goes on throughout this talk. So I think taking a step back when we think about accessibility, helping people with impairment and disability, I thought it would be useful to speak about what this could mean um, and particularly like in relation to digital spaces as well, I suppose. So I felt like this sentence from Microsoft Design comes from a really nice angle around what disability can mean. And it states that disability happens at the points of interaction between a person and society. Physical, cognitive and social exclusion is a result of mismatched interactions. And I think it's powerful to look at it this way. And I always encourage people to, to look at it this way. It's when a person's environment is not matching their needs, essentially, or serving their needs. So with that in mind, I'm going to walk you through different groups of impairments and disability that we need to consider um, when building software and explain some of the, the challenges people might face or experience in a digital space. So first we've got visual and this really impacts the ability to see and can range from mild or moderate vision loss in one or both eyes to com complete loss of vision in both eyes. Other types of visual impairment also cover like the eye sensitivity to light or brightness um, and colours as well. So for people experiencing visual impairment, it could be potentially quite tricky for them to rely on just vision alone to use a digital interface. 
and then we've got auditory so this impacts the ability to hear and similarly similarly to visual you know it's experienced on a range of different levels so it can range from mild to moderate hearing loss in one of both ears to complete hearing loss or total deafness people with auditory impairments might find it slightly harder to understand sound within interfaces um, such as like dialogue in videos for example and therefore they could need other ways of consuming information so we can't just rely on sound alone to communicate a message then we've got cognitive so people who experience cognitive learning and neurological impairments may have some difficulties with things like perception memory and attention as some examples and it, and it could be harder to focus on a digital product in a format that may not necessarily be too comfortable for them so you think about size with, you know think about size color text text or audio um, and even like the amount of information on an interface and so on so tasks like having to memorize and copy and access code for something or having to sort of understand complicated language or interpret symbols can, could present a bit of a challenge. Um, then we have physical, so physical or motor disabilities and impairments might concern limitations or weakness around muscular control. So people living with physical impairment may have trouble with their movement and coordination. So they might find it a bit harder to control something like a mouse, for example, um, and be able to make precise movements with that to control an interface or hold multiple keys down at the same time to perform an action. And speech, speech impairments affect the ability to produce speech that is recognisable by other people or software. So this could be to do with either the, the volume or the clarity of the speech. And these people may find it a little bit more difficult to use online conference software, for example, or voice recognition tools. So I think it's important to bear in mind that there are many reasons why people may be experiencing very varying degrees of any of these um, or multiple of these. For example, some people may have impairment and experience disability from, from birth um, or illness, disease, and even by accident, or they may develop impairments with age. And although people may have any or many of these, some people may not consider themselves to have an impairment or disability at all even if they do experience some sort of limitations so i think it's important to bear that in mind and we should also consider that um disabilities they can be permanent but they can also be temporary or situational and i'm going to get to that in a moment so just before we move on i wanted to clarify what assistive technology means and how i've understood it so assistive technology or assistive tech is a much broader term than what we might just mean within a digital sense um, but many people may use assistive technologies to help them in their day-to-day -day. so there's a good definition here from the Alzheimer's Society so assistive technology refers to devices or systems that maintain or improve a person's ability to do things in everyday life so digital products they need to work with these assistive technologies in order to be considered accessible and as some examples, these might be screen readers or text to speech software, for example, screen magnification software or even alternate input devices. So things like motion tracking or eye tracking, for example, um, there's a really good video by Apple actually on their accessibility accessibility page of their website, which just covers some of these and shows them in action. And I think it's quite powerful. So definitely take a look at that if you get a moment. And then we'll move on to the area of the talk around the why. So I think we probably, we probably all understand by now that, you know, digital accessibility is important so that we can provide everyone with equal opportunity. But I want to, I want to dig a bit further into the importance of accessibility and cover perhaps some of the less, the, not less obvious, but like other reasons of why being accessible is important. Um, beyond it just being you know the right thing to do and 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 helping people so in this section we'll cover how solving for one helps many i also have to say that i've nicked that phrase from microsoft but i really like it um, and a recent example of something that i think can really help us to understand the importance of accessibility and also just some more reasons some further reasons of why it's important too 
So when we're when we're speaking about those living with a disability, this is who we're really talking about. And it's about 15% of the world's population who are thought to be living with some some form of disability. And really, that's a substantial chunk of the population who are poten potentially excluded um, from digital products because they're just simply not accessible. But I think I want to go a step further than that and explain that accessibility doesn't just affect this, the, you know, the 15 percent of us. It actually reaches it reaches far, far beyond that. And this relates back to my point earlier um, about accessibility helping everyone. So I think we need to think of it in the way that because like, it's the time we invest in helping even just one person use our products can benefit lots more people. And this is really helpful to bear in mind and think of in this way. So how can we how can we demonstrate this? So I've pinched some illustrations and well, we earned some bit of data from Microsoft Design um, on this, from the same document. And we can we can see here how by designing for someone with a permanent disability, someone with a situational limitation is going to benefit too. So there's some examples here. So for the way in which we, we might add closed captions, for example, to digital media for someone who has permanent impairment to help them understand what's going on, that is also going to benefit someone who might have a temporary disability, such as an ear infection, for example, or something more situational, as shown here, like um, trying to sort of read something on a screen and navigate a busy, loud airport or other loud environments, I suppose, like a commute, commute for example. Um, and they're even beneficial from, it's, it's even beneficial from an educational standpoint. So there's an example here, such as teaching a child to read. But actually, when I've been speaking with this, um, with people at Redgate about looking at things like this, they were like, oh yeah, well, you know, subtitles and captions, they actually really help me even just to learn English or learn a language. So. Once you start kind of digging into this stuff, it it really um really comes to show how many people it helps. And you'll notice over to the right um some numbers, and this adds some perspective to the scale at which this covers. So you know, for the permanent twenty six thousand, a situa situational eight million, um, and a temporary temporary thirteen million that might benefit. And this yeah, seen seen kind of you notice the scale at which it covers and you can imagine the potential benefit that bearing accessibility in mind can have for so many people. And um, I wanted to add this in because this is my colleague Sybil's tweet. Um, so yeah, Sybil's a colleague of mine and she's actually my mentor last year. She's a wicked mentor, she's great. Um, but when I spoke about accessibility internally and was explaining that, you know, the permanent, the temporary, the situational sort of levels of disability, um, some a colleague actually shared shared that they'd seen this on on Twitter from Sybil, um, which I promise I did not pay her to to tweet. But there were this is I think this is just a stellar example of actually you know from one of my colleagues, which just it just brings this point to life. Um, I've got nothing but admiration for her. I think it's like it's important to know she's not had her arm amputated but even doing things like cooking or typing on her laptop are so much more challenging because she's got the situational limitation of a baby in the other arm so um so taking these these figures and these thoughts i wanted to apply them to something more relevant for all of us but i think that and i think this example really um really shows why considering accessibility is important so Moving on, um, recently, of course, we've all been living and experiencing this global pandemic. And I thought that speaking about COVID-19 would be a really powerful way of highlighting exactly why and also how accessibility is so important. So I guess before I start, actually, just like a side note, I really hope that everyone and their families are all in good health at the moment. It's a scary time. But um, yeah, I want to I wanna share with you exactly why and what this has got to do with accessibility. So around March, um, we were told this message in the UK, this is from the UK government, and actually now we've also all been in a second lockdown um, and we've pretty much heard the same message. So it's to stay at home, stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. And 
suddenly digital platforms for consumers, for students and staff, everyone, um, it, they all had to adapt rapidly to this. And, you know, people who weren't even digital had to adapt rapidly to this new situation in order to follow this government guidance. There wasn't, there wasn't really another option. We needed to stay at home to keep safe. And at Redgate, we, um, we moved to working from home, like many other companies did. But universities also changed to online lectures. People were told to do their online shop from home. Even GP appointments, you know, they turned to your doctor's appointments, turned to laptops and phones and social events even turned to Zoom. And I'm sure we've all experienced a, a Zoom quiz or two or probably 10 by this point. Um, but I think the point is so suddenly and it was it was really, really sudden. We we're all left with this little choice, but to rely on our tech so that we can carry on with our daily lives carry on with our daily lives but carry on with them safely and follow the guidance so for all of these scenarios and plenty more it, you know it's been utterly essential for them to be accessible otherwise some people simply may not have been able to do some really crucial tasks like ordering your feed shop like finding out online how to keep yourself safe or even just earn a living and speak to friends and family so there just couldn't be barriers between this sort of stuff. And I think observing that, um, the BBC have put it really nice in this article. Um, so many of the solutions we've needed for this pandemic are the same solutions like remote working that disabled people have been requesting for years. And I don't know what to call it. I've, uh, I said like side effects, I think originally, but I think it's a really interesting thing that's come out of the, the pandemic that's basically highlighted the real importance of accessibility and I think I think companies are beginning to adapt and respond if not already um, a recent example for us is that we've just had live captioning enabled for our you know day-to-day -day work calls um, and if you think about it like back to that situational type of impairment imagine if you're because all of the schools shut here over the summer um, longer than the summer actually I feel like she's just melted into one but um, if you think think about that and the, everyone's got their children at home and need to look after them and you're trying to work from home and you're in a, a room full of loud children um, potentially loud children you might experience a situational limitation um, or a situational impairment to, to hearing and um, to hear clearly it, so you know in your work meeting and captions could be a useful way to help you follow the com conversation for example beyond just helping those who are, say, permanently hard of hearing. So I think moving on from that, um, accessibility increases customer reach. And when we think back to that 15% that or at least 15%, um, that's 15% of potential customers that, that wouldn't or might not be able to use your products and may even potentially go to a competitor that is more accommodating and thoughtful. And I, I wanted to touch on some information actually that I was introduced to recently. Um, so I don't know loads about it, but it's an interesting thought. So it's called the Purple Pound. And um, I encourage you to go and have, have a read up about it. But the Purple Pound essentially is referring to the, like the spending power of disabled households. And that's defined as a household which has at least one, one of the members have a reported disability. Um, I've put a link at the bottom where some of this information comes from um, and upon just getting some, some numbers from this link um, the purple pound equates to 249 billion pounds a year to the UK economy and I think it also states in this link that nearly three quarters of disabled online consumers are going to click away from a website due to its inaccessibility so this is really powerful and important to bear in mind and I think next there are some laws around accessibility and I think I'm not going to go too much into detail on this because I'm really trying to understand a lot about them myself um, I'm still fairly early on in this learning process but I think the key takeaway here is that there is differing legislation in place to ensure accessibility requirements are met or at least acknowledged around the world so a couple of examples or two or three have the Equality Act here in the UK and more recently, I think in 2018, there's one around public sector bodies for website and mobile applications, accessibility regulations. And you also have the Americans with Disabilities Act and there's specifically Section 508. 
So I think the point is they're here for a reason and they're powerful and we need to we need to be mindful of them. And accessibility as well, I think having good accessibility makes your, your products better overall. So it's back to that usability thing at the start. So accessibility cannot be complicated to experience. Um, so you've got to have good usability. It's got to be easy, simple and pleasurable to use. And at Redgate, we have our ingeniously simple, um, I guess call it principle. Uh, and I think that's a, that really nicely reflects this thought, maybe. So a little Redgate emoji in as well. Why not? So um, this brings me on to the, the next area of the talk. Um, and it's an area I'm really excited to share this part of the talk with you. So I think it's about what we can all do to improve our, our accessibility. And I think with this section, we could we could think about it in two areas. So we could think about it as individuals, um, but also at a software development level, because after all, it's what the title of the talk's about. So um, although I want to talk about how we can build more accessible software and products, I want this to as much be about the small efforts we can be making as individuals too, because I really do believe that it starts with us, right? So once we're all armed with, with really good knowledge, then we'll be able to be in a much more powerful position to help our organisations improve our software too. Um, so in this section, I'm going to cover how to, some, some ways, um, some suggestions around how you can sort of boost your awareness and help boost other people's awareness. Um, and how to create and encourage a conversation around accessibility and some stuff we've been up to and how we can be more mindful of it during software development by thinking more holistically. So I think starting with boosting our awareness, um, we need to boost our awareness because accessibility is everyone's responsibility. This point I think will might become clearer towards the end as I speak about you know thinking about it holistically and take the whole process into account but we need to boost our awareness because it's down to each of us to make sure what we share is accessible um for everyone and for, and for us all to call out stuff that could just be doing a better job i think i believe that we're likely to be to be more might we're likely to be more mindful of accessibility when building our software if we're, if we're more mindful in, our, in just our day to day, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a daily norm to consider accessibility. So familiarising yourself um, with accessibility settings of different social medias, different softwares and other digital interfaces is a really, in my opinion, is a valuable thing to do. And I think with getting started with accessibility, this is something that definitely helped me was literally to just have a go with some settings. Um, I'm very much sort of a learn on the spot, learn as I go, you know, by doing person. Um, so yeah, just I would say have a go, turn on a screen reader or try using a high contrast mode or a higher magnification, for example. I think um, here shows some of the places actually, I was looking, you can find these settings. I've also just realised that I, I don't think I've updated my iPhone most recently, so they might be a little different to what I'm what I'm showing you now, um, but a largely, you know, not too dissimilar, I imagine. But I think this, the point is, this is a real powerful way of allowing ourselves to empathise with others who may use technology in a variety of ways. So experimenting with these features now and then is naturally going to help keep this at the front of our minds, I think, or at least it does with me. So yeah, have a go, that's important, but also take some time to consume something related to accessibility or even inclusive design as a whole and then you can begin to create a conversation around it. I think have a have a read through some different guidelines or the accessibility area of a website. Follow, I think even something I saw was like just following a few hashtags related to it. Um, here I've taken a few screen grabs but this is absolutely by no means you know everything <laughs> it's a very small slice of the stuff that's out there but i think over to the left i never i can i never remember how to say this it's either like ali or a11y i'm not I, I probably i don't know which way but um this is a really really useful resource it's like a community driven sort of project to improve accessibility um 
you've got the WCOG guidelines at the bottom, um, and these are like largely considered sort of best practice guidelines to follow in the UK, um, to my knowledge, to sort of meet those accessibility requirements. And I think there's some screen grabs of Microsoft, Apple and um, Google's accessibility pages. And I've also put in there the gov.uk's accessibility page, one of the pages, because um, with them, they, they really have to be, you know, all of them have to be, but there's some vital services that people need to access on gov.uk. They have to be accessible and they've got lots about how you can make sure your stuff is accessible too. Um, I think beyond that, there's, you know, there's whole plethora of information like books, podcasts even. I think my friend, my friend at works sent me an episode of the Design Systems podcast actually, which is about accessibility. Um, so that was a good listen. So there's there's loads of stuff out there and moving on from that, I think around creating a conversation, I think it's just important to share that knowledge, like, you know, have a, have a read, do some learning and then share it. So at Redgate, I've made sure that we've started an accessibility channel to discuss things we come across and that's working really well. Um, I think something I found out, found when starting with accessibility, um, it's because a lot of the learning I've done, you know, has, has been whilst I've started at Redgate. It's such a huge topic. I think I it can all in my experience, it almost can feel a little bit overwhelming of knowing where to start. Um, some of the guidelines aren't written in a particularly like accessible format, even. Um, and I think just get that conversation going to help others as well is what I'm trying to say, and stay curious. So I think my my personal favourite thing to do is. At, well, at the moment ever I swear, always is to literally just talk to someone have a conversation um, with someone and get speaking about it so I think even from colleagues but through to actually people who experience these impairments and disability themselves so prior to this talk I actually contacted a friend's daughter who is visually impaired to understand more about how she uses digital products and especially for stuff like her university coursework and it was it was really powerful. Um, I felt like I learned so much from that one conversation and watching her use her laptop. Um, and there was just I discovered stuff I hadn't really thought about before about how she experiences a digital interface. Um, she uses her laptop at five hundred percent zoom, and watching her do that made me feel quite uncomfortable at first. It was quite in intense, but it soon led me to understand, um, you know, from a sort of product design perspective, the importance of putting everything in a, say, a consistent place on the screen or the importance of keyboard shortcuts for her to be able to find things quickly rather than having to like surf through the whole, the whole web page. Um, so that was a sort of a powerful learning for me, I think. And then I just want to share sort of how because I it sounds so obvious, but it's so true. But um, this is why it's important to talk with real people, because we can't assume we know what's useful for someone when they might be experiencing the world in a completely different way to us. And I think so saying what helps who is near impossible because everyone is everyone's so different and all their needs differ as well. So I also wanted this session to help us improve the accessibility of what we share if there's something you can immediately take away from this and just start doing i wanted to share a few of those things so um i think like just some tips around what you share online hopefully so even just things like blog posts or tweets and so on i think if we're regularly putting this into practice it's naturally going to stay at the front of our minds and ultimately also help us in our sort of day-to-day -day jobs um and building accessible software so here are some things you can proactively do uh, in your day-to-day -day, and there are so many more um, but I just picked a few key ones out for us that have helped me so starting with um, using shorter sentences and paragraphs and also using clear headlines um, this is really going to make what you share a lot more digestible and far easier to navigate for people and then we've got closed captions, making sure your videos have closed captions. So the difference quickly between um, subtitles and captions for video content for a start is that subtitles assume a person um, that's watching it can hear, but they don't understand the language. So the job of subtitles is to translate, but captions on the other hand, assume that a person watching is hard of hearing or perhaps can't hear at all. So therefore they're gonna include descriptions of background noises 
and things like that, for example, to help a person keep context whilst, whilst following. So a good level of colour contrast is important because in images and pictures to help those who are visually impaired understand what you're showing. And using alternative text for images and limiting your use of emojis. Um, really, this is really to do with screen readers and I wanted to go a little bit further into those, both of those for a minute, in a, in a moment, because I've got some examples. Um, and then using camel case for hashtags, because this just makes it what you're trying to hashtag and say much easier to understand if you can see one word to the next. And also um, shorten links and make them more descriptive. So this is to do with a screen reader and a screen reader is going to read all the links out on a on an interface or a page. And if you have links, um, and I've been so guilty of this in the past, if you have a link that just says click here or this or something, then when a screen reader reads that, reads that out, that's got no context for someone. So they, then they're likely not to know where that link is going to take them. So what you want to do is um, actually make the hyperlink the thing that it's going to um so if we're linking to say a spreadsheet say a spreadsheet and about what it's about that's an example um so quickly um i won't play too much of this but this is an example of how a screen reader is going to read out emojis and i don't think we're i don't think we're always going to be this extreme with this many emojis but i just want to demonstrate the point of what happens if you're kind of peppering emojis in between words that you're sharing online um i don't know if you're able to hear this apologies if not i just have to share the video at the end but i'll just play like five seconds worth frame i read heart emojis beaming face with smiling eyes grinning face with big eyes face with tears of joy grinning face with big eye yeah so i'll leave that there but um a screen reader helpfully reads out the name of each one um the problem is though and i've also been guilty of this is um this can really break up your message and make it much harder to understand so even if you you know you're not going to limit your use of emojis try and put them in one place even i think is something useful to to do frame i read oh no i'll start playing again um so here's a couple of examples on linkedin and twitter showing how you can add alternative text to images so the point here is to help someone understand what the image is showing if they can't see it so um something like a screen reader is going to read the description out and if there isn't i think it's important to say if there if there isn't a feature on the interface that's going to help you do this then just simply write it with the description that you post with the image anyway and just start start it where you start the description just say image description um and, and describe it from there so alternative text should be really clear short and simple so you don't start a photo <laughs> don't start the description um with something like a lovely image showing or a nice photo of get straight to what's describing um the what describing what's in the photo or the picture i'm not sure why i chose a penguin as an example probably not going to post a penguin to linkedin well they may be i don't know i like penguins um so moving moving away from individual efforts and onto efforts we can make sort of as an organization um, or in the software development process my third point is around thinking more holistically so firstly i think i wanted to touch on from the from the customer perspective so and this comes back to the very start around that definition of accessibility and calling it you know saying that accessibility is the process um, in my opinion i really believe that we we need to be thinking about accessibility as a whole um beyond just singular points of interaction with our customers so i've probably i've probably missed a, lots of you know points of interaction off but these are some that come to mind especially for for redgate and i think um I was, well customers i'll read them out in a second but i think customers journeys don't stop and start in one place is what i'm trying to say we need to consider that whole experience um and so here, here we have websites, we've got our training videos, for example, um, social media and the sales process even. And we've also got product support, um, product experience. So that is, I guess, the actual product and documentation and research. So we need to be considering all these things if we want to sort of call ourselves accessible. Um, and, and think about that whole journey the customer might go through with us. So 
on the back of that kind of the flip side of the flip side but like the other perspective is the um the product development process and how we can bake accessibility into our product development process to make sure that it's weaved weaved in throughout i suppose so starting off with diverse and inclusive user research through to considering making sure accessibility is almost part of the the brief or the definition of what you would call the feature done um, designing with best practice in mind and building accessibility as part into part of the code um, and part of this recently for Redgate on this sort of design and development area is how we might build accessibility on into our design system better and I'm going to get to that soon there's been a lot of learning around that recently with us and also how um how you test with real individuals i think before that you know testing with software such as screen readers or um things that might filter the screen to become um monochrome for example is useful um those tools are definitely useful but testing with real individuals and our real users is going to be really powerful um back to that point of you know everyone's needs differ and the way they in which they experience our products are all going to differ so Try to test with real people if you can um, and also make sure you document feedback well so i think you can see how accessibility soon becomes like this for me at least this greater thing than just a bit of code or uh, color contrast for example in the design um, it's important for me to make sure that we see it this way um, so i think that's what i wanted to cover there um, and then lastly, um, what we're what we're doing at Redgate in this area. So on to the, on to the last area of the talk, um, I wanted to share with you some steps that Redgate have been taking. And I really hope um, by sharing this, maybe in, inspire some of you to start conversations um, amongst your colleagues or think about how you can apply some of this wherever you are. Um, a key a key learning for me has been to think about how we can sort of utilize existing opportunities um to help raise awareness and begin to create impact and the two areas i'm going to cover um, in this last section are the work that we've been doing on our design system um, and how that presents this unique opportunity to build accessibility in in from the start and also continuing the conversation on accessibility and making sure that we keep building that momentum so just onto this first area so we're currently in the process of reworking our design system honeycomb and um, i wanted to talk with you about how working on this has helped us accelerate some accessibility efforts so i suppose firstly what is a design system um i've pinched this from a, a really good medium post but a design system is the single source of truth which groups all the elements that will allow the teams to design realize and develop a product so basically it's, it's a toolkit or a set of building blocks for us us both in design and code that enables us to not only um build our products quickly but build them consistently too so it's really good to think about design systems as, as also constantly something that's like a work in progress they're much like our products in that respect there there's like new components may get added to them old ones might get tweaked um and we we've been recently we've been reviewing our components and thinking about how we can build and structure them better and also create more thorough documentation and guidance for us to use so i think this process presents a unique opportunity to um to effectively bake accessibility into what we're building and if we can make our components or essentially our design system accessible then we we know when people use it that's going to go straight into our products um so i'm going to run through a few points um before that actually i think it's important to recognize we're still on our on our journey to achieving that i'm really proud of us for recognizing this opportunity and beginning to make steps towards it so yeah how do, how do we bake it in so these are just a few top tips um around sort of building an accessible design system and building accessible components um these tips are no in no way similar to much of what i've shown no way everything but i thought they would be useful to share because they've definitely been helping me so first one is around color contrast and also avoid using color alone um, and just not relying on color essentially so 
um, especially for text, the colour contrast between text and background needs to be high enough contrast so that they, those with visual impairments are able to perceive what's being communicated. And there's lots of tools online to test colour contrasts. Um, but on the note around using colour alone, that means we're not relying on colour to indicate the meaning of things. So I think as an example, um, for Redgate, we're working in a very data heavy interface um, and we might rely on colour to indicate the status of things. So saying, say like a green dot could mean something healthy or a red dot could indicate indicate error. That's no good for someone who's red, green, colour blind, for example. So we need to make sure we're adding other ways of communicating. So using things like labels. Um, secondly, we've got resizable text. So if people need, um, need it magnified, it should or need to sort of enlarge what, what's on the screen. That shouldn't be, that shouldn't break the component in any way. The component should be able to scale. Um, all our components can be used with assistive tech, so such as screen readers, magnifiers, and braille displays. So I think this is an area I'm still learning about, but this comes down to making sure that the components are using the correct markup so that accessibility tools um, can determine, I think most importantly, the, the title, the state, and the value and the role of the, of the components. So, for example, um, we have lots of checkboxes in our in our products and our tools. So someone needs to know the role of the components so that it's you know a checkbox first off. They need to know the name or the title of the component. So I think just using SQL monitors as an example, you could um, you could have a list of checkboxes that are called instances or servers um, to know what you're going to be selecting. And also you need to know the state, so whether it's selected or unselected and the value if a component has has one um, and also the next point sorry is that they are completely the component should be navigable by keyboards and beyond that i'd encourage you to think about the structure of the component and that you can move through it using a keyboard in a logical way you would with a mouse so lastly as well um, don't use lots of motion so i think an example we've had to be mindful of is something like a loading or a, a spinner icon and making sure that that's not you know that's not going to present any challenges um and we're, i think we're still learning a lot in this area but the point is i suppose that we're just we're having a go and then last point is that we've um we've been continuing the conversation about accessibility and actually on the wider themes of diversity, equity and inclusion. So we've now got a monthly diversity discussion with the aim of getting together to learn and share e share with each other and sort of celebrate our individuality. Um, and we also just last week themed one of our open space afternoons on these topics. So, so an open space afternoon is a chance for the product development division to get together and share what we've been learning or ask about something that we'd like to learn or sort of speak and share about our practice. Um, so we had just as a few examples we had an internal speaker in we ran a book club session and one of the team's engineers spoke about some accessibility considerations that they've been recently making um, and we had a discussion at the end of the day so um to recap what we've what we've discussed and the really key things i've gone over today from from my perspective is that accessibility is about enabling everyone to use products equally and it can help everyone of all abilities. It's an essential part of software development and is important for many reasons. And each of us together can help improve the bigger picture and move towards thinking more holistically. And also try to use current opportunities to get started. So with that, thank you so much for listening. Um, I'll leave things there and hand back to Cathy, I suppose. Just put my email on the board, on the board, on the slide. Okay. But yeah. Thank That's you. Everything. Yeah, thank you, Elena. It was a lot to learn. And I, I'm even thinking, oh, I need to be putting alternate descriptions on all the on the images on Simple Talk. And I haven't been doing that. So I'm gonna start. Um I don't have any questions yet. So for those of you on the call, if you have any questions, now's your chance to ask. Just wait a, wait a minute or so. I never know how long to wait with these. I'm 
still not seeing anything. So I guess I guess we can say goodbye for today. Thank you very much, and um, thanks to everybody for attending this special session sponsored by Redgate today. And we will see all of you in the new year. So, yeah, thank you, Kathy, for having me as well. So, all right, we got a thank you in the question box. So, awesome. All right. <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah. Thank you. And the, re the recording will be available in the next day or so. Uh, you can find it at wit.pass.org, the link to it. So, all right. Goodbye, everybody.